Good uh, day, everybody. It's uh, Monday, uh, February 4th, and uh, welcome to week number five. Uh, I have a couple of things I want to uh, work with you on the syllabus. Uh, you know, I had a comment from uh, one of the class members, and I, I apologize for uh, some of the uh, looks like modifications and changes we're making to the program. Uh, let me let me take a moment to comment on that uh, because uh, I am very uh, sensitive to the fact that uh, when changes get made, it knocks people off stride and whatnot. And so I apologize for that uh, that occurring here. Let me make sure I've got the volume up as high as I can get it, so that uh, I think it's up pretty high now. Um, in any event, uh, I did want to touch on a couple things. First of all, just so you all understand, in case I hadn't said it before, uh, this is a new course for us here at, uh, at CBU. Uh, we put it together in conjunction with a couple of other folks, uh, their input. And uh, as such, being a new course, uh, I hope you'd understand that they all happen to have, they all will have bugs in them and so forth, and, and this one has a few. Uh, when I when I notice the bugs or the problems, I try to deal with them as quickly as I can. Uh, and actually, in some of them, I think more than not, I've decided either I can uh, delay a little bit of the work you might have to do, or in some cases, actually delete some of the work that, uh, for whatever reason, I may feel is is asking to do more than I think is appropriate, or perhaps is not as necessary as as we once thought it was when we first conceived the course and what we thought we wanted to do with it. So uh, that being said, of course, I have a couple of uh, modifications to make to the uh, to the week five uh, work, but hopefully you won't be uh, uh, disappointed because we're actually going to knock out one of the learning activities. Uh, and let me go through that with you now. And uh, then I made a uh, I noted something on uh, week six that I already have decided that I don't see uh, a reason to do that. So let me go through that as well. Uh, and then uh, let me make this representation to you at, at uh, some time during this uh, coming week. Uh, I will endeavor to go through six, seven, and eight more thoroughly or closer, if you will, now that I'm getting a feel of how we're doing all this. And I might make some changes there, but in all likelihood, those changes are not going to are going to be less work, not more work. And so hopefully, you'll appreciative of that, be appreciative of that. Although I. Again, have to apologize that uh, I can't just run right through this thing and no hitches, no changes. I, I might also say in all the years I've been doing uh, courses and teaching at a number of different schools here um, in Southern California, it's not uncommon for the instructor to make a few changes uh, depending on how the class is handling material, how the material is being delivered, whether there's changes uh, at the school level or whatnot. So we, we do have some changes that occur. And I apologize uh, to the extent that it creates some difficulties for you. I hope not. Uh, with respect to this week, week five, uh, we have a learning activity uh, number three, uh, dealing with employment discrimination, I ask you to, to uh, write up a personal experience or observation. And I'm not going to have you do that. Uh, I think you've got enough to do with, uh, with the discussion board and also with the uh, learning activity number four, which is the reflection paper. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do then for this week five, in addition to listening to my lecture here, is we're going to do learning activities one, two, uh, and then also learning activity four. So uh, we have the discussion board, uh, which is the Cumby uh, versus Woody Woo case on 491. Uh, then we're going to do your reflection paper, if you would, uh, and then re, uh, on uh, the reflection paper, uh, you're going to do the reviewing on page 509, and it uh, deals with a claim for sexual harassment, and I'm going to ask you to look at question four only, which is what's on the syllabus now. Uh, then the learning activity three we will not do this time, although I can see some good use for us, but I think I'd put it in a different location for the next time. And then last, uh, learning activity four, we will do that also, which is the employment relations uh, reviewing uh, section 489. Uh, and uh, that is uh, uh, at the end of the chapter here. Uh, it deals with Rick Saldana, the uh, 
the uh, employees named Rick Saldana. So it's the Saldana case that you'll be doing with, with respect to learning activity four. Uh, also, I'm probably not, I'm, I'm not going to lecture on employment discrimination this time. I'll touch on that the next time. Uh, and we'll go through that. And, uh, and then, uh, so that'll do for this week. And then the following week, uh, we have chapters uh, 24 and 25. 24 is consumer protection law. And chapter uh, 24, I'm sorry, is consumer protection law. Chapter 25 is the environmental law. Now, on both of those, uh, I, uh, with respect to chapter 24, I'd like you to know generally what the consumer laws are and what their names are uh, and what they're about. And you don't necessarily need to memorize the exact name. A lot of them have an acronyms, but uh, that being the case, uh, I'd like you to know those various consumer protection laws. And when I talk about them next week, you'll, you'll know which ones I'm emphasizing. And, uh, and then also on the environmental law. Now, what I would ask you to do for me is to do an outline uh, of chapter 24. So it would be like a study guide outline, uh, fairly, fairly abbreviated, and then have you email that to me if you wouldn't mind. Uh, so that's on uh, Consumer Protection, uh, Chapter 24, next week, week six. So those are the, the changes I see. I'll go in more detail, as I said, for week six, seven, and eight. Uh, I'm cognizant of the fact you're all working, and I'm also cognizant of the fact that we have the research paper coming in. So I may cut some of this back a little bit more in order to give you more time for the research paper. So let me see what I can do with that respect. And do it as soon as I can so that uh, you can do some planning. I know you need to do some advanced planning with this. So uh, that being said, uh, that's how we're going to go forward uh, for this week. Uh, we'll cover chapters 20 and 21, which are selected sections of the agency law and then the employment relations uh, law in chapter 21. And then I'm going to uh, probably uh, not get very deep into employment discrimination, if at all. I may touch on it uh, just to get you started, but I'll, I'll get into it in more detail in the next lecture. Um, or I may put it on sometime during the week or later in the week if I have time, uh, but it won't be necessary for you to read it um, uh, for this week. Okay, now, uh, let me talk about uh, the agency chapter, chapter 20. And again, uh, my apologies, but this again is less work. Uh, there are only four sections I want you to be concerned with, so I don't want you to read the other sections in there because I think this is the nuts and bolts of what I think is important for you to know about agency law. And those are section one, uh, which deals with uh, agency relationships and in particular, the employer-employee relationship. So section one really focuses on the employer-employee relationship. Uh, section three deals with the duties of an agent and a principal. Section six deals with the liabilities for torts, or negligence if you will, and crimes as between an agent and a principal. So if an agent does something, is their principal responsible for uh, the negligence of that agent? Uh, and vice versa. If the principal commits a crime, does the agent have any liability on that? So section one is employer-employee. Section three is duties of agent and principal. Uh, section six is the liability of either of those parties or jointly for torts or negligent conduct or for a, a criminal conduct. And then last, uh, section seven, dealing with termination of agencies, and the only, only portion of that I'm interested in for you to look at is on page 468, 468. And it's just that one page, and it lays out for you the bases for the terminations. And I'm not interested in going beyond uh, what really amounts to, on page 468, the first two columns, and when you get down to wrongful termination. So don't, don't be into wrongful terminations. You'll see five different scenarios for the termination of an agency relationship. And, and that, to me, is all you really need to have a grasp of uh, to get a sense of uh, termination of agency relationships, OK? So as I said, sections 1, 3, 6, and 7, and 7 in a very limited, limited basis, one page. And that'll take care of it for us on chapter 20. All right, so let me get started with uh, with this idea of agency. and. Uh, 
and to try to uh, uh, put it in the right reference because I think a lot of times when people think of an agent or agency, you tend to think of, uh, of a real estate agent, uh, someone like that. And, and the reality is, is that a, an employer-employee relationship, the employee is the agent of the employer. And so the law is touching on the activities of the employee as they relate to his representations of and working for the principal. Uh, a lot of people don't kind of equate the idea of an agent with an employer-employee relationship, but, but that's agency law addresses that relationship in that respect, and therefore it falls under agency law. So, so what is an agent? <clears throat> and an agent is someone who has a fiduciary relationship with their principal. <coughs> Excuse me. And so what is a fiduciary relationship? Uh, and it has to do with a person uh, being entrusted with someone else's property. Uh, so it's a person to whom property or power has been entrusted for the benefit of the principal. In this case, if you're the employee, you've been entrusted with, if you're a salesperson, you've been entrusted with a certain amount of authority to go, ne go out and negotiate sales and so forth. And on that basis, then, you're a fiduciary to your employer, who's the principal, in that you're a person who's been granted authority by him, entrusted with that authority, uh, to, to engage in conduct for his benefit. Okay? Uh, so you can be holding the asset or something of value of, of your principal. And that, again, puts you in a fiduciary relationship. Uh, an example, corporations have a fiduciary relationship to their shareholders uh, because a corporation is a, is a business owned by the shareholders, but the agents are the directors and the officers of the corporation. The officers and the employees work for the corporation, and the shareholders are the owners. So the shareholders are the principals in that respect because everyone else has been given authority or, or hired to perform tasks that benefit the shareholders, okay? Now, the two major categories of what I would refer as this agent, uh, agency law or agent principle relationship are either the employer-employee relationship or what we call the employer-independent contractor relationship. Now, usually agency agreements like this or agency relationships are established in a written agreement of some kind. In other words, there's a written contract of some kind involved. Um, and for an example, in, in the case of a real estate agent, if you're hiring a real estate agent to, to sell your home, you're the principal, there'll be a real estate agency contract that some of you have bought and sold homes will certainly be familiar with. It's a standard contract uh, written, prepared by the uh, California Association of Realtors and everybody signs it if you're being hired to uh, be an agent or if you're the homeowner hiring an agent to sell your house or so forth. Okay. Uh, the employer-employee relationship. Uh, for example, you'll have a salesperson whose job is to go out and sell the merchandise of the employer who's the principal. And he has the authority to bind the principal to the sale. So if he's got authority to go out and sell the merchandise and he knows what the price list is and he says we're going to sell you this uh, uh, this item, this uh, device, this whatever it might be, and we sell it to you for $500 per unit, he's bound the principal to that. He's bound the employer to that price. He's the agent. He's been given authority, apparent authority. He's out there with a card with the company's name on it. And therefore, he can bind the company to an arrangement with a third party uh, using that, uh, using that uh, relationship and, and that authority. Now, uh, the, uh, the other thing with respect to, uh, or the other, the, the other difference is, if you will, the other category, I'm sorry, is the employer-independent uh, contractor relationship. Now, this comes about... Uh, it often comes about in small companies because a lot of uh, small entities just getting started and, and some that are not just getting started have been around a while and they're kind of trying to skirt the law a little will have people working for them and they'll, they'll categorize them as independent contractors and the reason to do that, the primary reason is to avoid paying the FICA, the, the uh, Social Security tax if, if you are an employer you may know 
There's a 15% Social Security tax, or FICA tax, which goes towards Social Security, so Medicare and whatnot. The way the law is set up is the employer uh, pays 7.35 or something like that, and the employee pays the other half of it. So the employer avoids that if you're an independent contractor because he doesn't have to make a contribution for you. You're not viewed as an employee. Uh, is it against the law? But yeah, I mean, is it a violation of the law is a better way to put it? And the answer is yes, it is. But many small companies do that because you can see it saves them 7 to 8% on their payroll every month they do that. Uh, any clients I've had that have been involved in that kind of uh, arrangement, uh, I've indicated that y y I don't approve of it, not that I'm the last word. The court or the law is going to be the last word. Now, the IRS and their auditors, if they come in to audit your company, uh, but the reality is, and as a practical matter, uh, audits are pretty rare. Uh, my advice to people is, is that if you're going to do it, do it knowing that you could be caught for not paying the FICA, and there's a, a penalty and interest and so forth. But most people, companies can get away with it for a period of time, be it three year, uh, three months to six months. Sometimes companies will go a year or more with an employee. Uh, with a with a worker who they treat as an independent contractor, try to, and that's the primary reason to avoid paying the uh, FICA tax, the Social Security tax, and so forth. Let me give you just a quick example of how that why that is of value. If in our business when we hired people, and I think a lot of companies certainly are more larger than ours was are well aware of this. Uh, if you say you're going to hire an employee for forty thousand dollars, let me see if I have my handy trusty calculator here and you say you're going to hire someone for forty thousand dollars okay so you've got your forty thousand dollars so basically you're going to say that they cost you three thousand three hundred dollars a month okay but here's what we always did when you take the uh, the various uh, payments that an employer has to make on behalf of the employee to the IRS to the government we tack on another twenty three percent Okay, so if you take times 0.23, that's another $9,200. So the reality is, is when you bring someone as, as an employee and you, you offer them a job at $40,000 a year, that job is really costing you about fifty, dollars Because if you add the, the rule of thumb now, you can do 20%, 23%, 25%, whatever. But the additional add-ons that usually go with employing someone and FIC and what have you, Medicare and so on, uh, your your cost is going to be an additional 20, 23%. Even 20 at 40,000 is going to be another $8,000. So you can see why uh, small companies a lot of times are very tempted to go with the independent contractor relationship versus the employer-employee relationship. Save about $8,000 a year on a $40,000 employee. Now, here's the problem though. The problem is that the IRS has set up criteria to determine whether someone is in fact really an independent contractor or not. And the IRS stays very busy going into companies and blowing these deals out when they find them. Uh, and as I said, it's, it's not a rampant kind of, it's common in small companies or just getting started. Sometimes people will have 20 employees, but they'll add somebody into a new area of their business and just decide to start off treating them like an independent contractor. And part of that is to save the expense of bringing on a new employee. Not to mention, it's easier to terminate someone who's an independent contractor than it is an employee. So you have reduced the risk of a wrongful termination suit by an employee because they're an independent contractor. The key word to keep in mind is the word control. The whole concept of whether someone's deemed to be an independent contractor or an employee depends on how much control the employer exercises over that individual. Now, clearly you would understand, if the employer has, you must come to work at eight o'clock every morning, you can't leave till five, uh, you get a half hour lunch, um, you, uh, all your supplies are provided by me, your office is supplied by me, you report to this vice president of sales and you're a salesperson. In those situations, clearly, 
we as the company have control over that individual. And for us to pay them or say that they're an independent contractor is just not going to fly with the IRS or the courts. So the key is, is control. And when you talk about control, you're talking about the, over, the control over the details of the work that person's going to be doing. Okay. So uh, let's look at some of the, uh, some of the criteria. Uh, the criteria are on page 451. Uh, and some of the major ones are, uh, for example, how long has the working relationship been going on? Uh, so if someone's going to look at this relationship, be it the IRS or the court or whoever, uh, has this person been employed for uh, weeks, months, uh, been doing this job for about a year, or have they been doing it three or four years? Uh, in that setting, there's going to be a kind of an inference that, well, they've been here three to five years. You better have some other solid stuff that shows that they are not an employee. Uh, how are they paid? Are they paid per job? Uh, can you define the job they're doing and you pay them per job? Or are they getting a paycheck every two weeks? Or are they getting a paycheck once a month? Even though it's not going to have any deductions out of it, right? You haven't made any FICA contributions because you're treating this person as an independent contractor. But if you provide all the tools, if you establish their schedule for them, let's suppose you're trying to take a repair person in your company and say they're an independent contractor, but they have to come in every Monday or every morning and pick up the the tickets for the three or four maintenance jobs are going out to perform or service jobs, then you're controlling what they do and when they do it. And so that's going to raise an inference that it's an employment employer arrangement and therefore the taxes and so forth are recalling, required. Um, here's another part of it. If, if the employee is deemed to be an independent contractor, they are not protected by any of the employment discrimination laws. And the employment discrimination laws deal with age discrimination, deal with gender discrimination, uh, deal with disability discrimination. If you have a disability, an employer has to make reasonable accommodations for you to work. So you don't have any of those protections if you're an independent contractor. And of course, that's good for the employer because he doesn't have to fight you in court over something like that. If, like I said, in, in, with age discrimination, if you're over 40, there's a heavy burden placed on the employer to be able to demonstrate that the termination of that employee was not due to their age. Anybody over 40. If, if you go on to work for a company and you're an independent contractor, viewed as an independent contractor, but really you're both kind of looking the other way and this person's really an employee and you terminate him, He's going to be real sad to find out that everything's been put down as an independent contractor, and now all of a sudden he wants to use employment discrimination laws to try to uh, to try to protect himself. He he can do it, but he's got some problems of his own with respect to taxation and whatnot, because he's been treating himself as an independent contractor too. So, uh, but the point being that it's all a matter of control. Look at those criteria on page 451. Uh, they say such things, is the worker engaged in an occupation or business distinct from that of the employer? If so, this points to an independent contractor. Is the work usually done under the employer's direct or by a specialist without supervision? So if there's someone supervising closely what the independent contractor is doing, there's a presumption there that he's not independent, that he's really an employee. Uh, I already talked about does the employer supply the tools for the employee, for the, uh, employee, in which case he's an employee. He's not likely to be an independent contractor. Uh, for how long is the person employed? The person's employed for a long period of time. This indicates employment status. What's the method of payment? Uh, by time period or at the completion of the job? Because payment by time period, say every two weeks, tends to indicate employment status. So these are the things and, and also the kind of work that's being done. Is it something that's customarily done by an employee or is it something that's done by an independent contractor? So again, you have to be careful. Those are the two categories, employer-employee relationship, employer-independent contractor relationship. All has to do with control, how much control and supervision the employer exercises over the individual and how much freedom the individual has to do as he or she pleases. Okay. Um, here's an example, though, that you should be aware of in employment contracts. If the person is an agent, they're an employer, let's say, of DuPont, a big chemical company, 
Uh, this happens with, with a lot of these kinds of companies. When you go to work for them as an employer, you, you file under their uh, uh, copyrights and patent uh, provision in your contract, you agree that any uh, discovery that you make any invention you might be responsible for while working for the company belongs to them. So you give up any rights to a discovery or, or an invention that you make while working for them. So such, such as discovering some kind of new chemical or some compound that's of use in industry or business somewhere under your employment contract as an employee. Most chemists and people in the sciences give up any rights to make a claim to those discoveries for themselves. Okay, now let's talk about the uh, the duties. I'm going over to uh, uh, section three, uh, and we talk about the, the duties and uh, rights of agents and principals. And they're they're very simple. And uh, and I'd like you to uh, if you just look at these again. I've mentioned before these these heavy blue, uh, all in caps headings. Uh, they will pretty much give you if you if you look at those and take a line or two off of those in, in your notes that'll tell you what that section's about and that pretty well covers it and, and they're pretty commonsensical anyways let me touch on them okay the duties that an agent owes to his principal are there's five of them one performance that is whatever you've agreed to in terms of the working relationship to perform that job the agents also uh, has an obligation of what they call notification which is really nothing more than that the, the uh, agent, be it an employer, I mean an employee or an independent contractor, the agent has an obligation to keep the principal up to date on what's going on, on everything that he or she is doing in the furtherance of that agency for the benefit of the principal, in this case the employer, or if you're an independent contractor for the company that's hired you. So you've got performance, that's to perform, notification, which is another way of saying keep them current on everything that's going on in the in the project, the subject matter of the contract. Loyalty, and that is if you're an employee not out there uh, finding a sale and taking it to somebody else where you're going to get paid more commission. So an agent owes a duty of loyalty to his principal. The principal who's paying the agent is entitled to strict and complete loyalty from the agent. Uh, the, the next one, the fourth one, is obedience. And that is you take the orders that you're given by your principal. So if a company's hired you to do independent service work for them and you're a true independent contractor, you're still an agent and you're obligated to obey the instructions they give you. And then clearly, of course, if you're an employee, uh, you're required to, uh, to respond to instructions given to you by your supervisor, your bosses, whoever. Uh, lastly, particularly with respect to an independent contractor or someone who's been given authority to go out uh, to try to, say, get uh, commitments from other companies to use the services, but you're not truly a, a salesperson, you really are independent, then you have a duty of accounting, to account back to your principal. Let's suppose he advanced you funds for various things. Uh, to wine and dine potential customers, to take them places, to provide a... Um, a sample of something and you have to go out and buy it and deliver it to your potential client. You have a duty to account back to your principal what you did with the money. Any funds you're entrusted with, you have to account back. So, so here are the five. It's performance. As an agent, you have an obligation to perform the job you were given. You have an obligation to, of notification to tell the uh, principal what's going on with the job, what's going on with the uh, venture that you've been uh, hired to, to do. Be loyal to your principal and not do anything that's not to his absolute benefit. To obey the instructions you get. And then lastly, to make an accounting back to your uh, principal, uh, be it employer or uh, a company that's got you uh, doing work for them independently. Now, what about the principal? Well, the principal also has five duties. First is compensation, very, very uh, easily to pay you when you enter into an agreement, an agency agreement with someone. Obviously, the terms of that have a, a compensation paragraph. So the first obligation of principal is to pay you. It makes sense. Number one on the agent side is perform, do the job. Number one on the principal side is pay. Pay the agent for doing the job. Also, the principal has an obligation to reimburse you for any expenses. 
So he's got an obligation to pay you, and he's got an obligation to co to, uh, to compensate you or pay you, and an obligation to reimburse you uh, for expenses. He also has a, an obligation to indemnify you. Now, what does indemnification mean? It means if you do something on his behalf, and, and you do it properly and legally, and something goes wrong, and you end up being sued along with the principal, he has an obligation to provide defense, a legal defense for you, or... If you have to hire an attorney, he has an obligation to pay you, or he has an obligation to indemnify you if there's a judgment against you. Okay, so uh, let's suppose you get a judgment against you, and uh, it's for twenty thousand dollars. And uh, actually, in in a lot of lawsuits, if there's an agent and a principal involved, both are defendants. Let's say, and there's a award of forty thousand dollars against the both of you. You don't have to pay anything. The age, the principal has to pay that, which is called indemnification. He has to, any loss you potentially suffer, he has to pay for. Okay, so we've got compensation, we've got reimbursement, we've got indemnification, and then the principal has to cooperate with the agent. So that is, if the if the employee is the agent and he's doing business for his employer principal. And he needs certain things. He needs samples. He needs price quotes sent back to him, whatever it might be. They're the obligation of the principal to cooperate, to support him. So you've got compensation, reimbursement, indemnification, and to cooperate. That is support the agent. When you enter into the, you're the principal, enter into a, an agreement with the agent to do something, uh, he gets your support. He can't perform if you don't support him. So that's the idea of cooperation. And then lastly, as a principal, you're, you are required to provide safe working conditions for your agent. So to the extent that he's on your premises or in your, in your factory or shop or on your premises, if it's a service company, what have you, he's doing computer programming in your company as an employee, the condi working conditions need to be made safe for him. Okay, so um, let me look at one note here. Uh, one other uh, point about the relationship between principal and agent. If an agent uh, violates the duty of loyalty to his principal and takes something that's supposed to have been obtained for the benefit of the principal for himself, then the court looks at that and, and they impose what's known as a constructive trust. Now, let me give you an example. You hire an agent to go out and find you a piece of real estate, a piece of ground. You want to build some, a part of your, put a new building for your business on it. He finds this piece of ground and thinks it's really a good deal, and he buys it for himself. And you now are not unable to buy the piece of ground that you want because he bought it. And it turns out other ground nearby is not as available, not as convenient, not exactly where you want, much more expensive. The principal can go to court, bring an action against you as violating your duty of loyalty. And the court will, and, and by this time, you can actually have the deed to the property, and the property can be in your name. Okay. And the court will, what's known, they'll impose what's known as a constructive trust, meaning that property, which should have been obtained by you as an agent for your principal, is now in trust for that principal to buy. In other words, the agent must turn over that property, that thing of value, to his principal because he violated his, his duty of loyalty to his principal. And so the, the item of value is put in trust, so to speak. They call it constructive trust, so that the principal can go and get what he bargained for and what the uh, agent uh, failed to perform by violating his duty of loyalty. And that's the constructive trust part of it. Okay? Um, let's see what else we might have here that I want to talk about. Uh, okay, let's talk about liabilities for torts and crimes, which is section 6. Okay, we're going we're gonna to skip section 5, and we're going to go, uh, uh, we're actually going to skip 4 and 5, I guess, here. Let's see, where am I? Uh, yeah, and we're going to go to uh, section 6, which deals with the torts, uh, liability of the principal nation for torts and crimes. Okay. Uh, 
first of all, the principal is liable for his own torts. So if you have an employee that, that is your agent and, and he does something, or he doesn't do anything wrong, but the agent, but the principal does, then the agent's not going to have responsibility for that. However, uh, the principal can be liable for torts that are committed by the agent that he had knowledge of. For example, if, if you hire someone to drive your delivery truck and you know they don't have a driver's license and they get into an accident, you will be responsible for that. You'll have liability for that because you knew that he had no driver's license. Even though you didn't drive the truck, even though you didn't cause the accident, as the principal, you're going to be liable, liable for that negligence, for that tort by that driver because you knew he had no license and therefore you shouldn't have allowed him out onto the road. Okay? The principal's also liable if the agent makes a misrepresentation. So, for example, if you have an a, a employer, employee who goes out and promises the product for $300 when he knows it should be sold for four or five, uh, and along comes the, the uh, customer who says, okay, I'll take my, my item for $300, and you say, no, 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 this item costs $500. And the customer says, well, I have it right here in writing from your agent that I only have to pay three. It doesn't matter. I have to deliver that item to the customer for $300 because the agent, the employee, was my agent. It's probably probably a salesperson, and it's my problem to get the $200 from my agent because he made a misrepresentation that I have to stand behind and I'm liable for. And the idea is I, I'm the most able to control him. I sent him out there, and he exceeded his authority or he... He failed to perform with the, within the authority he had. And the third party, innocent third party, is not going to have to suffer for that. The employee or employer is going to have to uh, deliver what the uh, agent promised to deliver, even though it was wrong. Uh, and now, here's uh, this. there's a concept called uh, respondent superior. Your book talks about respondent superior. Let me see if I can find you exact location. Uh, it's on page 466 under liability for agents negligence. 466 under liability for agents negligence, respondent superior. And the concept is, is that a principal is responsible for the torts and the negligence of its agent if those, uh, if that negligence took place in what's known as the course and scope of his employment. So if you have an employee who does something that causes injury to a third party, and he's representing your company, your company will be responsible, even though he was negligent, because he was acting within the course and scope of his employment. For example, he's driving your delivery truck. He has a license. He's no, everything is up to speed, but he gets involved in an accident on the way to deliver your product to somebody. Well, he's, he's performing his task of driving the, the item to the customer, in the course and scope of his employment. And under that circumstance, you as the principal, you as the company, are responsible for any damages that he causes while in the course and scope of his employment. Now, there's another concept, and we'll just use the term frolic and detour. Frolic and detour. Now, this comes about this way. I'll give you two examples. You're driving your, in fact, I think the book says it this way. You're driving the, the uh, the, the delivery truck and uh, you have a various route that you take and, and you know your wife knows your job knows what you do and and she says to you oh by the way when you're out making your deliveries this morning would you drop by the post office and drop off these Christmas cards and you say yeah sure so you go and you you make a delivery at one point and maybe a mile to the next delivery but in between the post office you pull over into the lot you put the mail in the slot or go inside, drop it in the box, get out, pull out in the delivery truck and have an accident. Okay. Well, that is a detour. Okay. But it's still within the course and scope of your employment because it's not an enormous detour, so to speak. You haven't gone way outside. The, you've just made a momentary detour, but that still keeps you within the course and scope and therefore your company will still be responsible for that. Okay. 
Now, let's take the other example of what we call the frolic. So remember, you've got frolic and detour. In the frolic case, you as the principal are not going to be responsible for the example I'm about to give you. In the detour case, you're going to be responsible because your employee, even though he may have momentarily left the strict path of his job to do a quick errand or whatnot, that's not going to absolve you from liability. But the frolic is, and here's the frolic. The frolic is your employer, take the employee takes the delivery truck out, and he's got seven or eight deliveries to make. And he goes out and he makes the first two or three deliveries and uh, has a, a lunch, goes out to make his next delivery, and then gets called by two or three places that he's going to deliver. And they say, well, you don't need to deliver right now. Or he finishes deliveries early. doesn't matter. And he decides that he's got a pal down the street, and they're going to go stop at a sports bar and drink a few beers and watch the afternoon basketball game. And then he's going to go back and make his last delivery and come home, or go back to the, to the shop, and then he's going to head home. So he makes two or three deliveries. He stops and meets his buddy at 1 o'clock at the uh, Joe's Sports Bar. They sit there and drink some beers, watch the basketball game. He gets in the delivery truck. He goes makes a del another delivery, uh, goes out to make a delivery and gets into an accident and smashes up the truck and injures somebody. Well, that's a frolic and detour. He is not within the course and scope of your business. And therefore, he's going to be liable and you are not. Okay, so that's how Respondent Superior works. Respondent Superior means that you as the principal, you as the employer, are responsible for the acts, you have a superior position, of your employee. However, he's got to be operating within the course and scope of the employment you hired him to do. And if he is in, on a frolic away from and outside the course and scope, and it's it's case by case basis, then at that point a court would determine there's not going to be liability to the employer, to the principal, because he had gone outside of course and scope. He was totally departed from his work, from his normal work and what it would normally be. Okay, so that's the idea of respondent superior. Um, and I think that's about all I have to tell you about um, this part. If you'll see frolic and detour on page 466 also is there. Uh, let me move this over so I'm not totally out of picture for you all. Uh, and so that's pretty much it of agency. So the big ones are uh, the, the category employer-employee and employer-independent contractor. And the idea of control, know what the rights and the obligations and duties are between the parties. Uh, uh, let me recap here a little bit just to make sure. Understand the agent is in a fiduciary relationship to his principal. And he is someone who's been entrusted with the property or the authority by the principal to perform tasks that benefit the principal. Not him, but the principal. Benefit the principal. Okay? And then, of course, when we talk about the, uh, the issue of whether or not he's an independent contractor or employee, depends on those factors on, I believe, page 451. Uh, so you need to, to get some idea of what those are about. Uh, and then uh, know what the rights are and uh, obligations and duties of the, of the principal and the uh, agent, and, and you pretty well have it. So uh, that's, the, uh, that's what we have to talk about tonight on uh, uh, principal uh, agency, agency law chapter 20, uh, principal and agent. Okay, let's move over to employment relationships. Let's move over to Employment Relationships, which is Chapter 21. Okay, now the first thing the book talks about is employment at will. Now, some years ago, uh, I would say probably until, gosh, I don't want to say probably the 60s or 70s. By the 70s, the, 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 the view of employment at will had changed. And here's how. Employment at will means that either party can terminate the employment relationship at any time for any reason. We, the terms we lawyers use in these employment uh, arrangement issues are uh, for cause or no cause. In other words, most employment contracts that are written allow you to terminate an employee for cause, and it lists what those causes are. And they, there's such things as dishonesty, stealing, uh, conviction of a crime. Sometimes if, if you have an employee that declares bankruptcy, 
you can set down your, your bases for their termination for cause. And then you have a section for no cause, where you just decide, I don't need any more people. Uh, I don't like the job you're doing. I don't like the color of your tie. It's not supposed to matter. You're an employee at will, and you can be terminated at any time. So for years and years, that's, that was just it. There was no, geez, there's a reason why you shouldn't terminate me, you can't terminate me, or one thing or another. That's all been changed over the last 20 years, 25 years or so. And it's been changed to the extent that the courts have begun to carve out more and more exceptions to an employment at will. And again, part of this whole idea of employment at will is if, if, if someone's an employee at will, then they don't have a lot of the, and my nose is itching like crazy, I apologize. I'm, I'm not sure I know what to do about this except uh, not scratch it, but rub it. I apologize. Um, this happens every time we do these lectures. Must be something in the air. I don't know. In any event, uh, the courts have begun to find this is, is unfair. Uh, they don't like the idea that you can just toss people left and right and out of the, out of the company for whatever reason. So there are many times when they will look for ways to, to find that they're not employees at will, but that they're employees who are hired for on a more per, on a permanent basis and you need to have some basis to fire them. You can't just fire them at will. And the reality is the concept of employment at will is really to the benefit of the employer, not the employee. Uh, even though the standard legal language says either party can terminate the contract at any time for whatever reason, the reality is that this is, a, this is more powerful, powerful for the employer than it is for the employee. So what the courts have come up with is this concept of implied contract or also the idea that, that it's implied that an employer will deal with an employee in good faith, that he'll exercise good faith, which means that he won't just fire somebody because he doesn't like the color of their tie uh, or he doesn't like the fact that they're overweight or he doesn't like the fact that uh, uh, there's some, some race or gender or what have you. He's got to have some kind of a valid reason, some kind of cause. Now, here's, here's where the courts started coming, building a foundation for that. It started mostly in the employee manuals, because more and more companies put out employee, employee manuals. And even though the employee manuals didn't say you're guaranteed the right of employment, they often had very positive language in there about becoming part of the family, and we want you here in the company and all that sort of thing. And the courts from that began to issue rulings saying that under the imply, under a concept of an implied contract, you can't discharge that employee except for some cause, some valid recognizable legal cause, like dishonesty or stealing or what have you, or being late to work uh, all the time, that sort of thing. Uh, so this was the idea of uh, treating the employee with good faith, treating them fairly, um, and uh, and that's the way the courts have, have created more and more exceptions. Now, what you'll see, though, in contracts is, depending on the level, and, and by the way, the lower level employees seldom have a written contract, although more and more companies are starting to go to that in an attempt to protect themselves from wrongful termination suits. And so they will say, uh, you know, you're an employee at will, and they will also say that nothing in this contract, in their employment contract, shall be deemed to create any implication that you're being hired on a on a, any other basis. So the lawyers are trying to take out this idea of, of giving the courts the right to claim there's an implied contract based on the employment ma employee manual or that sort of thing. So uh, companies try very hard to to protect themselves on this at will employment and, and are successful a, a good deal, if not most of the time. But the courts, if they if they see what they what looks to them to be an unfair termination of somebody who's who's theoretically or or even on a, on a document said they're an employee at will, uh, the courts may may stretch as much as they can to try to find that it's not an employment at will. It's an employee. It's an implied contract of employment it needs to be treated in a fair manner in good faith. And and you're terminating this party for these facts is not in good faith and therefore they have rights as a, of an employee who's been unjustly terminated. 
Okay, so that's the uh, that's the idea of employment at will, and uh, I think you'll see here uh, actually on page uh, 475, 474 they talk about exceptions based on contract theory, then they have exceptions based on tort theory, and exceptions based on public policy. Okay, so look at those three. As I said, using that that blue heading, uh, bold heading. Put a sentence or two down for each of those paragraphs and you'll be fine. You'll know because you probably might throw your question at these very easily uh, and you'll know what they stand for. And it's going to take you a line or two to mark down what, what exception on, based on tort theory is. Uh, here's one, uh, whistleblowing. And that's an important one. And uh, the courts are now more and more protecting whistleblowers. So, so someone who has an employment contract that says they're an employee at will uh, I'm sure you all probably know what a whistleblower is, but a whistleblower is an employee who sees conduct or activity going on in the company that he thinks is illegal or improper or actionable civilly by some other party, whatever it might be, and he blows the whistle. <laughs> in other words, he goes to some other third party authority. In most cases, these whistleblowing things deal with the government, a government agency or whatnot. And you get that uh, very often with an employee uh, who is disgruntled for one way or another, and they'll go turn in the company for doing some one thing or another. Uh, generally speaking, until probably uh, 2000, 2002, uh, if you were a whistleblower, you got fired. So there wasn't a whole lot of whistleblowing going on. Uh, but the government, where the government first found the uh, benefits of having whistleblowing, encouraging it and protecting it, was in government contracting because historically the government has literally been raped by private contractors who do business with the government with overcharges, excessive billing, and all this sort of thing, duplicate billing. It's, 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 it's horrendous. You hear when they talk about it with our budget issues today and how they're going to try to improve uh, uh, the budget and cut down the deficit. And one of those is to get rid of the fraud in, in government contracting. Believe me, it's enormous. I, I would not be surprised that we don't get uh, taken to the cleaners for uh, $50 billion a year, maybe $100 billion a year in fraudulent contracting and, and uh, handling government contractors over billings, phony billings. And it's it's really outrageous. And, and worse than that is because I have personal experience from a, a neighbor that I knew who was had a contract with the uh, federal government to provide parts for helicopters, for military helicopters, and the part cost him something like, you know, five dollars to make and he was selling it to the government for sixty and they were paying it. Uh, because the government contracting officer either didn't care. I mean, what's his incentive to get the best price for the government? He doesn't care. And that is rampant through the government. And uh, uh, and so the government came up with the idea of if you were a whistleblower on a government contract and, and they caught a government contracting company uh, taking advantage of them and overcharging or not, they gave you 20% uh, of the amount that they caught the person for and recovered. And a lot of these cases were multi-million dollar cases. They find and they found some named companies uh, sticking it to the government, uh, charging, overcharging, and one thing or another. Uh, and in those settings, uh, some of those amounts were ten million dollars, thirty million dollars. And if you were the whistleblower, you were entitled to ten, twenty percent of what the government collected on the overcharges. So on a ten million dollar deal, and the government got back, you know, say they sued and settled for four or five, you're entitled to ten percent of of uh, four million dollars. Not a bad payday. Uh, but whistle whistleblowers were still being fired, and they were still being if not fired, discriminated against. They would be given some job down with the janitor from being a controller in a an accounting division of one of the larger companies. I mean, that kind of stuff. So laws have been passed to protect the whistleblowers. Probably the most famous whistleblower in, uh, in the short term back in 2002 was a woman by the name of Sharon Watkins. And she was a vice president in the internal audit department of Enron Corporation. And if you may recall, Enron was at the time in 2001, was the largest uh, private corporation bankruptcy in the history of the country. Uh, over $2 billion cost the company folded. 4,000 4, people lost their jobs. Uh, most of them had almost all their stock in Enron. 
And all this occurred because about five or six executives were cooking the books. Uh, the CFO was playing all kinds of financial games, and, and basically the financial statements were phony. Uh, they weren't accurate. The company was losing money left and right, but these guys were getting huge bonuses and stock options because to the, to the world at large, with the phony financial statements, they were making their, their profit, they were making the numbers that Wall Street was looking for, and their stock was going through the ceiling. And when Sharon Watkins went to Ken Lay, who was the CEO of the company, he said, she told him, this is what I've been seeing when I've done my auditing work inside, and the CFO has taken all of this debt and moved it off our balance sheet and put it into subsidiaries that are unrelated to us, and therefore he's not recognized them as debt. And he was taking millions of dollars of debt and taking it out of the company and hiding it and putting it in other places. So that his, his, his 10K, if you will, which is the annual statement that public corporation issues to the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is the basis for all major investing, was, was not accurate, was inaccurate. And uh, Sharon Watkins was a whistleblower. She uh, actually was on the cover of Time Magazine as, as uh, one of the women of the year for doing it because the, clearly she's going to lose her job probably and, and they tried to, to uh, kick her downstairs for a while but before, before the, uh, they could really do anything effectively it came out publicly in the company. In, in about um, 60 to 90 days the stock went from $90 to $3.50. Now imagine if you're a 65-year-old employee of Enron and you had $500,000 worth of Enron stock in your retirement plan and that's what you were going to retire on. And it, be, it went from being worth uh, you know, $500,000 to $39, $39,500. And that's what happened to many, many people at Enron, which is, a, which is more than enough justification why the, the CEO and the CFO of those companies are in prison where they should be. Um, in any event, she was a whistleblower. The law now protects whistleblowers as best we can. Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, which is the law that was, was written by Congress in response to the Enron scandal and a bunch of other major corporations that had, had cheated on their reporting. Uh, Sarbanes-Oxley has a provision to protect whistleblowers. Okay. Um, now you also have the issue in employment employee relationships of wrongful discharge. And so you can have wrongful discharge for hostile work environment. Uh, you can have wrongful discharge for sexual harassment. Uh, but it creates dilemmas for employers uh, because let's suppose you have an employee who comes in and charges that she's being sexually harassed by a manager. And so you start looking around and investigating. Uh, the manager has the manager fires her, right? Fires her. She she claim or she quits saying. You know, it was a hostile work environment, so she sues the company. So the company checks it out and looks at the manager and say, we think this manager was really responsible for this. We've been sued. We're going to fire him. So they fire him, and he turns around and sues the company for wrongful termination. So who, who, what do you do as the employer? You have an employee says it's a hostile work environment. She sues you for that. Or if you turn around and say, well, I think it is a hostile work environment. We're going to fire him instead of her then the next thing you know, he's suing him for wrongful termination. This happens all day long in business. And you have this going on. It's a, and so therefore, you can see why companies a lot of times want to try to have independent contractors because firing someone in today's world in a, in a major company, in a sizable company, can be a very tricky thing to do. And their human resources departments have become very, very adept, very sophisticated and try to meet all the rules and laws and requirements and procedures of fairness and whatnot to document everything in an employee's file so that they can withstand a lawsuit for wrongful termination. Um, and so that's, uh, that's an uh, employment matter and employment relationships between employers and employees. Um, okay, let's turn to section two, which is the wage and hour laws. And the only one that I want you to kind of be aware of is the minimum wage law. Now, we, the uh, uh, Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, which is uh, 1938, Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, FLSA, I'd like you to know what that one is, that's established the minimum wage. Uh, and Congress periodically revises it, but it says uh, that employers can't pay less than X number of dollars an hour for a worker. 
Uh, and then they have overtime provisions, which are a fertile area for litigation. Uh, plaintiffs' lawyers representing employees are constantly bringing lawsuits against companies claiming that they're not paying overtime properly. Uh, and you have what's known, as some of you may probably well aware of this, have what they call exempt and non-exempt employees. And exempt employees tend to be managerial type people, administrative and managerial. And so they work a 40-hour week or maybe 50-hour week or what have you, but they're paid a salary. They're not viewed as subject to the overtime protections of the FLSA. Ex Non-exempt workers are your line workers, your, your lower-level workers uh, who are paid an hourly wage, and they're entitled to overtime. And it can be a very complicated, uh, California is very complicated. Let's say you have someone doing a 40-hour week. And, uh, and they work uh, eight, eight, they don't work eight hours five days a week, they work 12, 12 hours one day and then eight hours the next. Well, and when all ends up to 40, you say, why don't I owe overtime? No, you owe overtime on the day they worked 12 hours. You owe overtime or a time and a half for those four hours above eight. So it's a very, you have to real, it's a very tricky kind of thing. Uh, the overtime pay statutes, both in California and federal, but California's is particularly tricky. And here's how it becomes a, a risk to an employer. Uh, and a friend of mine who's CFO for a, a, a shoe operation, shoe company that has about uh, 25, 30 stores, is you get a disgruntled employee. Um, they come in and claim that you didn't pay them properly in overtime, you know, whatever. Uh, they will then hire a lawyer. He goes to the company and subpoenas all the records. And he finds all the employees, both current and past, because he can get the records going back five years. He puts them all together. He comes to the conclusion that he thinks they've gotten not gotten their overtime pay correctly. And let's suppose the company just didn't wasn't sophisticated enough and said, "You well, you work 40 hours a week, so we pay you the 40 hours a week." It turned out you had one day where they worked uh, 12 hours in one day and four the next, so that your total was eight doesn't matter, you would do time and a half for that, the 12 hour day for those four hours. Now he goes and finds 300 employees who had similar situations and now he's got a lawsuit that's worth millions of dollars, several millions of dollars, and now the company has to defend that. So that's where it's dangerous. That's where companies have to be really careful about their overtime pay and making sure they keep good records and make payments according to those, those uh, standards. Okay. So uh, know a little bit about the overtime pay issues that, that come up there. Uh, Section 3 deals with layoffs. I'd like you to know about what's known as the WARN Act, uh, Workers Adjustment and Retaining Notification Act. I always get a kick out of these acronyms. They, they torture the name of the law in order to come up with W-A-R-N for WARN. And that's the concept of the WARN Act which was uh, 1988, and that is to adva give advance notice to employees that there's about to be a layoff. So in that setting, you'll, if you look at the statute, it requires 60 days notice if you're going to do a layoff, and you'll see where it goes on to say uh, it's required at least 33% of the full-time employees at a single job site and at least 50 employees or at least 500 full-time employees. So the WARN Act defines the term mass layoff as a reduction in the force during any 30-day period resulting in the employment in an employment loss of either 33% of the full-time employees, that's considered a mass layoff, or uh, at least five at least 500 full-time employees. Okay, uh, an employer employment loss is defined as <coughs> excuse me a layoff that exceeds six months or a reduction in hours of work of more than 50% during each month of any six-month period. Now, I wouldn't require you or ask you to give me the real in-depth specifics about that, except to say that it requires 60 days notice of a, of a plant closing that employs more than 50 full-time people. Okay, so that's the magic number is 50. In most of these federal statutes, it's 50. Uh, if you have 50 or more employees, then these federal laws apply. If you have less than 50, a lot of these federal laws do not apply with respect to employment law, employee relationships. And as an aside, uh, this, you know, the government passes these laws, a lot of them well-intended, 
And then you have the law of unintended consequences. And here's an example that I'm going to give you now. <clears throat> Not in the book. But as you know, Obamacare applies these various requirements on all kinds of companies. And among them are, I think it's a 3.8% tax, additional tax on payroll or whatnot, uh, that an, or an employer has to pay. I don't even know if it's on payroll. It's just, I think it is on payroll. But he pays 3.8% towards Obamacare. Okay. Now, the law doesn't apply to a company that has less than 50 employees. Now, you know the economy is struggling, and you know we have a lot of unemployment, people looking for jobs. And what's the unintended negative consequence of this law? They have begun to report, in a widespread across the country, companies that have 55 employees or 60 employees or 57 employees, what do you think they're doing? They're getting rid of people so they can get down to 49. So they're either figuring out ways to do efficiencies, they're getting people to do more work than the others were doing, but they're cutting back. So now you're losing jobs because of Obamacare. I'm not making a judgment on whether you're for or against Obamacare. But here's an example of the government going to supply uh, health insurance for everybody, so they say, and it's not going to cost anybody anything, but they're going to have the employers pay for a lot of it, and then it turns out that companies that don't have 50 employees don't have to abide by any of this law. So what do you think a businessman who's got a company at about 53 employees is going to do? He's going to let four people go. And he's not going to hire anybody else. And so you say, well, you know, well, you know what else he'll do then? He'll, form, he'll divide the company's activities in half because he wants to grow. And he'll form two companies. And he'll have one company that does this part of his business, and he'll hire 49 people there, and then he'll start growing the other side of the business, and he might start with 10, but now he can get up two separate companies, keep them under 50 employees, and not have to pay any of the Obamacare. I mean, businessmen are not stupid. They know how to make a buck. And uh, so here we go. That's There goes your uh, employment, uh, job employment growth, uh, because you've whacked these business, small businessmen with additional taxes for the national health care program. So anyway, just kind of an aside. Okay, a couple of the others that I want you to be aware of. Uh, one is the Section 4 of the Family Medical Leave Act, and I do want you to, to be able to tell me about that. Uh, you have to have been employed for over a year with the company when you're laid off, uh, and uh, it only uh, family leave only works for uh, close family members. So it only works for wife, parents, children. Uh, I'm not sure it says brothers and sisters. Um, I thought it did at one time, but I'm not positive. Uh, but anyway, it, it allows for family medical leave to, to care uh, for a family member, uh, and the employer has to keep your job open uh, for six months, I believe it is, uh, at which time then they can decide whether they, you're going to try to come back to work or if they're going to fill your job. Okay. Um, uh, here it is. Um, the employee can also take up to 12 weeks of qualified exigency leave to handle specified non-medical emergencies where a spouse, parent, or child is called to active duty. So that's a, an aspect of the law that's been added for in light of Iraq and Afghanistan for employees. Uh, under the Family Medical uh, Leave Act, expressly covers private and public employees who have worked 1,250 hours for their employer and for at least one year. An employee may take family leave to care for a newborn baby or child recently placed for adoption or foster care. An employee can take medical leave when an employee or the employee's spouse, child, or parent has a serious health condition requiring care. So it's got to be almost an immediate family member. So I want you to know about the Family Medical Leave Act. Um, uh, OSHA which is called the Occupational Safety and Health Act, which is uh, OSHA, it's known as OSHA. It has a tremendous impact on business because they have inspectors going out, walking into private companies all the time, inspecting to see what they th how they think the safety conditions are. The regulations are enormous. They cover a huge breadth of areas and so forth. And OSHA has the authority to close you down. They literally can close can order a company closed because of work conditions and so forth. And this is one of the areas where they talk about onerous regulation because there are 
times that the OSHA laws are pretty extensive uh, and put a lot of regulation. And when you put regulation on a business, there's an expense involved in meeting that regulation. Whether you have to hire a new employee, whether you have to bring somebody in and change the configuration of your factory or your, or your business, the way it's set up physically, uh, the machinery you use, uh, whether it has to have various different types of guards or whatnot on it, all that costs money. So when OSHA gets into the middle of your business, it's probably going to cost you some money. Is it a good idea? Of course. Worker safety is very important. But uh, sometimes some of these governmental agencies can run amok and get way out ahead of themselves. And uh, dealing with them can be very, very difficult. And I've had clients who had run-ins with them, and I've had a heck of a time uh, trying to get the problem solved. And then to a large measure, I feel like a lot of it's not of OSHA's business. I don't think it really does, in some settings, apply to, to worker safety. But the regulations are the regulations and often have the force of law. So uh, be able to tell me what OSHA is about and what it does. Uh, I don't really care that much about your getting to the specifics of enforcement procedures, except that they can, can close a company down if they want to, and they can uh, uh, demand criminal prosecutions uh, in certain settings. Um, don't worry about workers' compensation laws. Don't worry about Social Security, uh, income security. The only one that I think is really important for you to know about is pension, private pension plans. And uh, the law is called ERISA, which stands for Employee Retirement Income Security Act, ERISA. And here's what was going on and brought about ERISA in 1974. And this is a law that was, was well, uh, is something that's certainly of value should have been done. I support it 100%. I think most people do. And here's what was happening up through 1974. You'd have a small company, and let's suppose the owner employed 30 people, 20 or 30 people. Under the tax laws, then, the owner could take chunks of money from his company and put them in a retirement, a private pension plan, um, and, and avoid all taxes on that money. And so he would take money out of people's paycheck you know, say 10%, and say, this is our pension plan, we're going to take 10% 10 of your money and put it into the pension plan. So you might have an employee that worked uh, five or 10 years, okay, and then he leaves. Well, under the terms of the pension plans prior to ERISA, uh, there, was, there was no vesting time, meaning the vesting meaning the time when your rights attach to the plan and you're entitled to the money you contributed. Believe it or not, prior to ERISA, you could have people that worked for a company for 20 years, 10% of their salary went into the pension plan, and they were entitled to none of it. And what was happening was, and this, I guess, gets capitalism a bad name, and, and justifiably so, is the owners were keeping that money for themselves because it was their company, and they were going to be running this company forever. Or when they retire, they're going to hand it down to their kids or maybe sell the business. And when they sold the business, they were going to take the retirement fund. Well, over 20 or 25 years, that retirement fund might be a million dollars, of which the owner contributed, say, half, 500000 But all his employees, past and present, contributed 500000 And And if he's going to sell the company, the pension plan can continue, but he can take all the money out of it that he wants out of it because it's his pension plan. He doesn't have to sell it with the company. And the employees get nothing. And that's what was happening. They weren't vesting. You could work a lot of years, put the money into the retirement account, the pension plan. You also had situations where private companies would spend the money for other things to run the business or whatnot, because it was kind of a self-insured kind of thing. Okay, under ERISA, a couple important things. One is everybody vests. A, the private pension plan, a company can still have a private pension plan, but every employee who contributes to that pension plan vests within five years. So you can't make the vesting period, excuse me, longer than five years. So a worker that's there. Now, in addition, if you have an employee, because always these plans require the employee to make a contribution, and then the employer will usually make a matching contribution, which is uh, tax deferred or non-taxable at this point. So let's suppose it's a 5% plan. So he you contribute 2.5%, he contributes 2.5%. If you contribute 5 he contributes 5 
right? And so you're building this pension plan. Now, within three years, you decide to leave. Well, you're not entitled to, and you haven't invested yet, you're not entitled to the 2.5% two he put in, but you are entitled to the 2.5% you put in. So even though you haven't invested under ERISA, you're entitled to get your money back that you put in, which to me is a no-brainer and certainly belongs in the law. And it's a pretty ugly thing to think that there were uh, employers of small companies that were running these pension plans, deducting the money from the from the employee's salary to, you know, look at it, 2% grows, you know, gets gets to be a big number after five or six or 10 years. And all these other employees would quit and leave and they weren't entitled to anything. They hadn't invested. Sometimes they'd have a 20-year vesting period or a 15-year vesting period or, you know, it just way out there, 30 years. And nobody stayed 30 years. I mean, few did. So you can see why ERISA was really important. It came along. And I need you to know what ERISA is about and what it does and what it's done to help people. So it's on 485. That whole paragraph will pretty well fill you in on that. The next one on page 486 deals with COBRA. And what COBRA is, it's, it's called the, again, Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act. I love our Congress. They are a great crowd, let me tell you. If we could throw them all out and start with a fresh group of faces, I'd love it. Uh, but in any event, um, it's called COBRA like the snake cobra. And what it stands for is, is that an employee who leaves voluntarily or involuntarily must make an election within 60 days that he wants to invoke his rights to cobra under his employer's plan, health, health plan. What this does is it, <clears throat> it allows the employee who's no longer an employee to have medical insurance for a period of 18 months from the time he leaves the company. So whether he's late, because what, what was happening and does happen is people lose their job and they lose their medical benefits because they're, they're no longer um, with the company. And you have to be a member of the company to be in the group. So Pilbara came along to say, for 18 months, the employer has to provide the, your access to his plan, but you have to pay the premium. But at least you have the plan. So if you're on COBRA, it's the same premium that you were paying before. You pay that premium, because sometimes employers would pay all of it or half of it. depends on what their plan is with their employees. But he might pay all of it or half of it, that sort of thing. Uh, here with COBRA, you pay it all. So let's suppose it was $300 a month for your medical insurance. Your employer was paying $150. You were paying $150. Now you're going to pay the whole $300, but at least you've got the insurance. Because if you go out out of a group, that same insurance might cost you five or six hundred. Because individual policies, as you all know, are much more expensive than a group policy. So that's what COBRA is about. And please make sure you know what that's about and what it stands for. Uh, you'll and you'll note it says 18 months. It's on page uh, 486. Uh, now the next area, section seven, is very important, and I want you to really know what's in there. Uh, and the primary part that is most important to me that I would probably ask you questions about is the employee privacy rights section. And in today's world, it's extremely important. And it deals with electronic monitoring. And that, that deals with the idea that an employer can monitor an employee's emails, their telephone, their computer, okay, uh, they're texting and so well I don't think you text on the office computer I don't really know but I guess you could have an iPhone supplied by your company and you can text on that and so I'm sure there's ways that they can probably check that but the big one is tends to be in business the classic one is the company monitoring your email and also your activities on the on websites or on the sites on the, on the company computers now here's the conflicting issues under the legal concepts of, of rights of privacy, the courts often go off in a factual situation and say, given the facts of this case, did the party, the plaintiff, let's say, in this case the employee, have, the, have a reasonable expectation of privacy? In other words, when you go into the ladies' room, you have an expectation of privacy. If your employer puts cameras in the, in the ladies' room, with or without your knowledge, in all likelihood, that's going to go away 
because anyone who complains, the lawyer that represents that company is going to say, they have, in the ladies' room, they have a right of, of expectation of privacy, and therefore you can't put a camera in the ladies' room. Okay? There, these cases came up in the high schools because high schools were putting cameras in their, in their bathrooms because the kids were going there smoking marijuana or doing other drugs or what have you, or smoking cigarettes, whatever. And, uh, and the issue came up whether or not the students had an expect, a right to privacy or an expectation of privacy in the, in the bathrooms. Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, and that was the justification for putting the cameras in, uh, was to, to prevent drug use and so forth in schools. And the courts saw that as a valid reason, a reasonable reason to do it. Here, employers want to protect their proprietary material. They want to protect their confidential information, their, their pricing information, their customer lists, uh, and anything else that's going on in their company. They don't want that coming out of their company. So on that basis, they are, they are given the right to monitor email. Now, the way they do it, the, the right way to do it, is you let your employees know it's being done. Uh, I'm not sure what the cases said where the employees were not. I think probably the first cases the employees weren't notified. Uh, but the courts have steadily held that monitoring employees' emails, particularly when you've provided, it's on your site, your work site, it's your equipment, it's your server, it's your computer system, it's your email system. As the employer, you have a right to monitor the activities of your employees on that system. And the courts recognize that. And what employers do, employers do now to make it even more solid is, is that they, they have a form that all the employees sign that says, I acknowledge and know that I've been advised that my email is subject to monitoring, as are my phone call, you know, all that sort of thing. And, and, uh, and I agree to that. And therefore, there is no reasonable expectation of privacy because they've agreed. They know that they're going to be monitored. Uh, I always get a kick out of these phone calls. And I'm sure you all make these phone calls to banks or whoever, and they say, you know, this re this uh, this telephone call may be recorded for uh, quality assurance purposes and training purposes. That's all a bunch of BS. Okay, that is pure and simple BS. It's just to protect their rear ends from phone calls that might come back to bite them later about something that you asked about the business or questions you had or challenges you made and they want to be able to say we're recording that you know we've recorded this telephone call but they don't want to tell you they're recording your telephone call because they're afraid of you and they're afraid of something that might be said that, that they want to protect themselves from they're going to tell you it's for quality assurance purposes or training purposes it's just a bunch of bunk they're just covering their own rear ends and they not training anybody based on what goes on in those telephone conversations. But in any event, there I am on the soapbox again. Uh, so the electronic monitoring, uh, and uh, let's talk about it here. Uh, it's called the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, the ECPA, 1986. Uh, it covers electronic forms of communication. The ECPA prohibits the intentional interception of any wire or electronics communication. So the act starts off protecting the privacy. You're not supposed to, you're not supposed to intercept uh, people's electronic communications, okay? But that's not at the workplace. You'll see the last paragraph where it says, um, excluded from this prohibition is electronic communications through devices that are furnished to the subscriber or user by a provider of wire or electronic communication services, which are you, you as the employer, your electronics system of email and websites and what have you, uh, and that are being used by the subscriber or user or, or, are by, or by the provider of the service in the ordinary course of its business. This is called the business extension exception. Allows an employer to monitor employees' electronic communications in the ordinary course of business. So the ECPA, 1986, Electronics Communications Privacy Act, it, what it's prohibiting is people from the outside diving into people's emails either at your home or at your work or office, what are people from the outside hacking in and intercepting your emails. 
but what it's excluding from that is in the ordinary course of business it's called the business extension exception so the employer can monitor emails in the ordinary course of his business that you're engaging in okay so that's the uh, electronic monitoring of employees uh, lie detect detector tests are generally uh, not required uh, unless it has to do with something then with safety or whatnot you can't really require anyone to take a lie detector test or certainly as a as a means of, uh, of uh, a job being hired in most jobs, except for jobs that might involve, say, transportation, where you're out on the road, safety, and so forth. And you, uh, sometimes government agencies will do that, require that. Drug testing, as probably most of you know now, is accepted uh, by, because the question is, you're taking your blood or whatever, to, that's viewed as a, a, a search and seizure. It's viewed as a, a violation of your right to privacy. It's your own blood and your own body. You're entitled to privacy with that. Now with respect to drugs. Employers can test, as probably some of you have been tested. Uh, they can test an employee to see whether or not there's drug use involved and can use that as a basis to terminate the employment. So uh, that's pretty much all of it for tonight. Uh, I actually got finished in an hour and 25 minutes. Uh, please make a note. I will send an email around with what I said relative to uh, relative to the changes in the syllabus again for which I apologize but sometimes it's just necessary to try to get the bugs out of this program uh, I hope it hasn't been too onerous for you um, but I think uh, we're going on okay I think I've gotten almost all the proposals but I do need the uh, research project proposals because we're down to about three weeks before they're going to be due uh, I'll work on getting the syllabus final final finalized it's pretty well finalized but if any changes they're probably going to be to your benefit because I'm probably going to knock some work out of them because I am aware that you're you know going to be pressed down to the end here and I, I don't want to see that uh, please get in touch with me if you have any issues or questions um, and uh, once again I uh, my one disappointment about this is not getting to meet any of you all face to face or or uh, talk to you personally about things. So I do have my phone number. If you just want to call up and talk about the course, I'd be happy to talk to you anytime. Uh, I hope it's going well for you. And uh, um, sadly, you're my first class. I think I'll get a lot better as we go forward into the coming semesters. Um, don't know if I'll get a chance to figure out the Web and WebEx before we finish up. Hopefully I can. I've got so much on my plate. Um, I actually do this at uh, two other business schools as well, but uh, I think this is a great program here at CBU, and I'm really enjoying it, and uh, I, I really like some of the work you've done. Uh, some of your writing and so forth is really good, and uh, and I, I think you took to heart my proofreading uh, admonishment or warning. You've all done a great job on that, and I commend you for it, and uh, and I see that most everyone in the class, in fact, I really say for the most part the entire class, uh, I can tell that you've given thought to the writings you've done. That's greatly appreciated by me. Uh, to the extent that I'm stealing any of your copyrights, um, I've had more than a few notes made off of your papers, and that includes everybody in the course, uh, that I thought were very insightful and were going to be useful for, to me in, in uh, uh, putting material out there in, in uh, future courses or whatnot. So I thank you for that, and I appreciate it. And uh, with that being said, I think I'm going to sign off here tonight and uh, get working on reading your papers that came in. So you all have a good week. And uh, again, if you need anything, shoot me an email or give me a call. Uh, good night now. Bye.